Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. This is the first annual Neurosurgical TV uh, online conference. Uh, this year, it's brain, the topic is brain tumors, and we're starting off with Slavin Gocovic. He's a third-year medical student at the uh, University of Croatia in Zagreb, uh, and I'll let him uh, introduce himself also. And, for, and we also have uh, a regular, Simon Downs. Good morning, Simon. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the presentation. And Simon, you're a medical student in Japan, correct? Yes, uh, with Oceania, U Oceania U University of Medicine. Okay, welcome, Simon. Okay, uh, Slavin, it's all yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and privilege to open uh, this uh, great, great conference for brain tumors uh, as the first presenter. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, neurosurgery and medical education. Excuse me, excuse me, Slavin. Could you center your camera a little bit more? Your camera's a little, little low. Low. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A little higher so we can see your beautiful face. Uh, can you see me now? A little bit more down, or, or excuse me, up a little bit. It's can you see me now? Yeah, that's. Um, uh, I guess that's good enough. Uh, uh, just, just, just yeah, a that's second. good. That's good. That's think, good. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, I I I'm going to talk about medical education. Uh, well, uh, I don't uh, actually know how is. The during the medical school and medical students are left uh, to search uh, their knowledge in neurosurgery by on their own uh, so uh, in this light uh, I made a rotten course at my university in which I tried to uh, bind students who are interested in neurosurgery together I did this in association with the uh, with the University of Zagreb uh, association of students who are interested in, in neuroscience in general and uh, we started uh, doing these courses every two weeks on Thursday the first semester and they are still going on uh, in, in this year so I have here a little presentation to show you this uh, I will start screen sharing now okay uh, can you just this is the right. Uh, okay, you see what I'm screen sharing now. Y yes. Uh, okay, this didn't work. I think. Uh, just a second. You're okay. You're not showing the slides. These are not slides. No. No, it's not the slides though. No. Okay, I can hit the right screen. Just a second. Uh, Uh, okay, so now do you there, see the slides there you now? Go. Yeah, okay. you see it now. Okay. Okay, so let me just start it up. Slideshow. Just a second. How do I go? Present. Okay. Okay. So. You can see the. I hope you can see this. Uh, this. These are. This is the first presentation I made uh, that was presented uh, a few months ago, uh, in the, at the University of Zagreb Brain Research Center. And uh, I put this. Uh, this is the the uh, logo of our student association, and this is the logo of the ANS, which kindly provided all the videos that we were using. Uh, when when I first started uh, uh, started developing my interest in neurosurgery, I, I recognized that the Professor Rotten's work is probably the one of the most uh, fascinating works done in the field of neuroanatomy and neurosurgery. And I recognized that neuroanatomy is probably the basics of neurosurgery. So I uh, started studying the materials that Professor Rotten provided such as uh, are these uh, videos from the ANS collection and uh, the 
uh, his book, uh, the the great book uh, Professor Rotten made that is uh, currently the most published book in neurosurgery. So uh, this is Professor Rotten uh, operating his uh, the one that uh, I uh, that in honor of of whom I have made all this and I conduct, contacted him. So we made all these presentations in accordance with him. Uh, I'm very sorry that Professor Rotten passed away a few months ago. So this this is a kind of a, a remembering tradition as well. So uh, we, we use red cyan 3D glasses in our courses in order to view the images in 3D. Uh, so this was the initial setup. Uh, should we meet one, one per month, one in two weeks, one week? Uh, one in two weeks uh, was the chosen. Uh, frequency and this was the place where it all began. So uh, we are trying to view neurosurgery and neuroanatomy through introduction, viewing and discussion and uh, with this we are trying to develop our knowledge and understanding of neurosurgical procedures and uh, how uh, the, the operations, neurosurgery and thinking is done. So uh, this is just one of the things that the students will need. Okay, uh, and when we go on uh, after the course, we designed the little little diplomas the students can get uh, in order to to have uh, uh, something to to as as a recognition that they passed this course and that they are introduced to neuroanatomy and neurosurgery as as well. So uh, I will now go to another presentation which will present you how we do this, uh, how, how we do this at our medical school. So, uh, in this other presentation, uh, I, I want to say at first that I uh, had the opportunity in Zagreb during my, uh, my uh, interests to, to come into this, uh, various wars. We have a very great collaboration with our professors in all medical centers in Zagreb. Uh, so I uh, spent uh, quite some time uh, in the wards and operating halls of uh, Children's Hospital Gleich in Zagreb under Dr. Jurashin who introduced us to the wonders of pediatric neurosurgery. So I will try to base on the most uh, important region and the most complex region of the, uh, of the interior of the skull and that is the posterior cranial fossa, which is the most common place of pediatric brain tumors. So, the promotion poster that we made, and uh, we tried to promote it, uh, we, we had some success in this with professors and, and uh, neurosurgery residents coming to our uh, presentations. So, uh, we uh, when we talk about the interior of the skull, we, we can see here three cranial fossae. Uh, I like to call this the, the clock. It goes around and it shows all the approaches uh, that can be done to the skull base. I'm talking about skull base right now. So this is the posterior fossa, the one we will focus on. It is the deepest and largest of the three cranial fossae containing ten of the cranial nerves and uh, also containing uh, the most complex neurovascular structures. So, uh, if, if we go in front, uh, one of the most common approaches is the transcranial approach, which is today done through, through an endonasal endoscopic approach. Then from lateral we have the anterior petrosal middle fossa approach which I talked before in, in hangouts on this platform neurosurgical TV. Then posterior petrosal transtemporal and retrosigmoid, these are all uh, posterior approaches that are, uh, co that are most commonly used to uh, come into uh, the posterior fossa. And transtemporal approach uh, can get us into the middle fossa. Then far lateral transcondylar approach, this is the approach I will be talking about tomorrow. And finally the midline approach, uh, the approach we will focus on today. This is the most common approach uh, in uh, when the surgery is, is to be performed on the, uh, on the fourth ventricle and the rhomboid fossa. Okay, so 
the most common uh, positions that are used are sitting position. Uh, this position is very, uh, it, it is uh, controversial today because in Romania uh, the, the place which we have many connections with, uh, they are using uh, this approach in every operation of the posterior fossa pathology they, they encounter, especially in tumors. But uh, in other uh, centers such as uh, perhaps in, in Japan, this approach is forbidden. So it is very interesting these differences in, in the world's neurosurgery. Uh, one of the the th the, the things that uh, goes in, into account of sitting position is the very clean surgical field, as since all the blood goes down and uh, it it is uh, also very natural. You have all the uh, anatomical relations uh, natural as they are in the anatomy textbooks. Other positions, despite uh, this position, which can be very dangerous sitting position because of the air embolism that can occur, can be the lateral parkway position or prone position, which are which is one of the most uh, frequently chosen ones in other centers, which are not doing the sitting position. So, let me just show you a quick uh, set of slides now. I have this uh, here. On my uh, background, uh, these are just the anatomy pictures I want to go through. Okay, so uh, these are all pictures from the Rotten Collection. Uh, I hope you can see this right. And uh, I would like to start with uh, the overview of the posterior. So this is already the cranial uh, vertebral junction the to occipital joint and vertebral arteries uh, coursing around these joints. Uh, this is the arch, posterior arch of atlas here which, which has been cut with uh, laminectomy and uh, here is the brain stem, the, the structure that is located in the middle of the posterior cranial fossa along with cerebellar, cerebellar pedicles and uh, the mesencephalon, which can be seen here, along with the only cranial nerve that, that uh, courses on the back side. It exits the brain, brain stem on the back side of it. This is the nervous trochlearis, uh, trochlear nerve, fourth nerve. In this next picture, when we remove the brain stem, uh, we can see the vascular... I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Slavin, we don't see the slides moving. I see you on the te uh, telephone approach. Uh, uh, you, you don't see the slides moving. Yes. Uh, no, just, just a second. Sure. Uh, what, what, uh, where, what was the last slide you saw? Uh, tele, uh, Televela approach. So you didn't see... Uh -huh, okay, okay. So just let me just... Uh, okay, now it's the moving. Okay. Again. Now it's moving. Uh, can you see? This? Now I see slide thirteen. Yes. Uh, can you see this? This is my desktop now. Uh, now I see slide thirteen. No. Okay, I need to screen share again. Okay, and this can Just all be see. fixed in editing, so not, don't worry about it. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, um, thank you that you told me. I'm just. Yeah, I no problem. This is the okay, live version. Okay, this now. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, this is the, the anatomy picture. Great. So, okay, so I'll just start talking from here. So uh, I want to go through the anatomy of the posterior fossa first. Uh, in this anatomical picture made by Professor Rotten, which is amazing, uh, I was re reviewing the slides of my, of my presentation earlier today, and uh, I was uh, again amazed with, with the quality of these uh, of these anatomic, anatomical preparations. So uh, we can see all the components and uh, and the topography of this region. So this is the cranial vertebral junction, the atlanto occipital joint, and the posterior arch of uh, C1, which has been cut with laminectomy. The vertebral artery uh, coursing around this joint, and here the medulla oblongata with cranial nerves passing to the sides. The fossa rhomboidea, the cerebellum has been removed here. Cerebe cerebellar ped pedicles and mesencephalon above it all. 
with uh, the trochlear nerve, fourth cranial nerve, the only ner cranial nerve that is uh, exiting the brain stem from its, uh, from its uh, posterior side. And uh, now when we pass to our next picture, if we remove the brain stem, which is the central structure, which is uh, in the anterior, anterior and central part of the posterior fossa, if we remove it, we can see the blood vascularization, the arterial, arter arteries of the posterior force. Uh, these arteries are very important because they define the three neurovascular complexes that can be found in the posterior fossa. So uh, I will just revise them briefly. This is the vertebral, vertebral artery, which enters through the foramen magnum and uh, connects with the contralateral vertebral artery into the basilar artery, which can be seen here. Also, uh, this basilar artery then continues as the posterior cerebral artery and uh, uh, the posterior part of the cerebrum. Uh, basilar artery in its course and the vertebral arteries, uh, respectively, give three uh, branches which are bilateral and that supplies most that supply most of the components of the posterior fossa. So the first one uh, we can see here this is the pica, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, then the ica, anterior anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which goes to the anterior a portion of the cere cerebellum and the lateral portions of the uh, pons and uh, brain stem, and then the SCA, the superior cerebral, cerebral artery. This artery is going to the superior or a tentorial surface cerebellum, as we, we will see later, and supplies it. So these arteries are closely correlated and uh, explained uh, with their anatomical relationships to the surfaces of the cerebellum. So pica, starts, uh, pica goes to the suboccipital surface, ICA goes to the anterior surface, and SA goes to the upper surface or tentorial surface. Uh, this is the view from lateral uh, with its, uh, th this picture, this slide is intended to show you the relationships of the asterium, which is one of the most common uh, orientational points on the skull and uh, the cerebellum. So this is the transverse sinus here uh, con continuing from the sigmoid sin sinus that we hear. These are the, the dural sinuses of the posterior fossa. Uh, and in our next picture, we will start with the surfaces of the cerebellum. This is the most Hi, Slavin, we've lost your sound. I think we've lost the sound. Yeah, he's not. I think he's using Wi Fi today. Um, and also, we don't see the pointer moving. Um, Can uh, you hear us? Can you hear Slavin? Well, well. Well, Sam, what do you think so far? It's great. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, um, I'm, unfortunately, we can't see the pointer uh, moving uh, when he talks, but I, if he could say, for example, upper right, upper right. left, or, or give us some orientation um, okay. for those who are not... I think most people watching are familiar with their brain anatomy, but um, it's great because it's a great review. He's looking at the all of the major vessels, so I, I would really want to to know with a pointer, but we can't see. That's okay, but maybe. Um, okay. I think he's rejoining. Oh, here's Slavin back. Okay. Okay. Slavin. Go ahead, Slavin. Go ahead. We lost your screen share. You, you, you getting the screen share again, Slavin? Uh, let me. I don't know what's. It's okay. You'll get it. You'll get it. Okay. And uh, no. Can you see this? This no. yeah, yes, we can see yes. it. And uh, Slavin, I just wanted to say we can't see the pointer uh, moving on the screen. So um, 
you could just orient us by saying uh -huh. right, upper left okay. or okay. Okay, so thank you. Just continue. Uh, just tell me what last thing uh, talk when you saw the pictures. Uh, what oh, yeah, what was see. the last picture before this? Uh, okay. We were looking at a lateral. Uh, uh, I believe it was lateral. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 So I'll just start from here. So uh, this is the anterior view of the brain stem and cerebellum, uh, as it can be found in the posterior fossa. Uh, we can see in the upper part of this picture the pons, uh, then in the middle part the pyramids, and in the inferior part the medulla oblongata, which continues to the vertebral column. Uh, on the lateral sides, uh, these, these are the flocculi. These are the most primitive nodules of the cerebellum, which cover the foramen of Lushka. This is very important anatomical landmark uh, for identification of the uh, cranial nerves that pass here. Above the, above the flocculus, that's a small part of the brain's tissue on uh, each lateral side in front of the cerebellum. Uh, upper, uh, up, uh, the most upper bundle of nerves is uh, the seventh and eighth nerve along with the intermediate nerve and then the cranial nerves goes as they're counted. Uh, so from eight, uh, nine nerve, goes the pharyngeal, tenth nerve, eleventh nerve, twelfth nerve and so on. So this is the more closed up view of the frame in Slushka. The flocculus is on the uh, left upper portion of your screen, the small bit of tissue in front of the cerebellum. And uh, the, the lighted, uh, the, the nerves that are lighted are uh, with in yellow color, are the seventh and eighth nerve. So, nerves, nerve, facial nerve and vestibular cochlear nerve. Uh, also, you can see here the core plexus, which is uh, exiting the foramen of Lushka. Uh, and this arrow indicates the most common uh, site of entering into the foramen of Lushka, just to indicate you where, where is it, where it is positioned. This is the anterior communication of the, post, of the uh, fossa rhomboidea, or the fourth ventricle, and uh, the anterior part of the brainstem. Uh, this slide intends to show you the complexity of various vascular and uh, structures and nerve structures in this area. So, as I explained before, uh, these are the uh, branches of the vertebral artery and basilar artery here coursing around the cerebellum and brain. This is the, the most uh, the, the area with a lot of its complexity. And then, as I mentioned before, one of the most important anatomical relationships here is the SEA coursing of the uh, the nerves and the alka, which can be which can we see here that goes very close to the facial and vestibular cochlear nerve on the upper left part of our screen. Uh, then, as follow, uh, the facial and vestibular cochlear nerve this is commonly done in operations when you need to enter the, uh, the internal acoustic porous. Uh, you follow these nerves and you can see the arterial loops surrounding them as well. This, this can cause some problems with hearing and pain. Uh, in here along with tinnitus as it is considered. So, uh, this picture shows you the loop of the ICA going in uh, the porous acousticus and the interus and uh, the meatus, internal meatus of the acoustic canal. Uh, nerves that are shown here, uh, the most upper one is the facial nerve, the lowest one is the vestibular cochlear nerve, and uh, between them the intermediate nerve, which can consist from as many as 16 bundles. Uh, so it is a very, very uh, tight position here, tight area to operate in. Uh, as we proceed to the lateral, we can see Bill's bar. Uh, this is an uh, uh, anatomical landmark also, which is uh, the transverse crest. 
uh, made of bone which uh, separates the facial area, the upper area, and uh, the lower area of the vestibular corner. And uh, in the lateral view of the posterior cranial fossa, uh, this is, uh, these are the relationships close to the petrosal surface of the cerebellum. So this is the anterior uh, portion of the cerebellum, anterior surface. Uh, it is bilateral, so on each side uh, of the cerebellum we can find these relationships with the temporal bone. And uh, here shown is the uh, porous acousticus internus, I told you about with the nervous fascia, the facial nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve, nervous trigeminal nerve is uh, above left in your screen and the endolymphatic sac which can be seen in the bottom right corner of the screen. So uh, other close-up views of these relationships. And one of the most important things you cannot forget is the relationship of the venous sinus. This is the jugular bulb in the right uh, right uh, low position. And in the middle uh, left part is the uh, carotid artery which courses below uh, the trigeminal nerve. Can be see here, and uh, again one view of just one view of the fundus of the meatus. Uh, the bill bar is the transverse crest, which is placed in the middle. Uh, the upper area is the facial area, and uh, the facial area is positioned to the left. The upper vestibular area is positioned to the right. Then the inferior vestibular area in the below right corner, and in the below left corner. Tractus spiralis foraminosus. This is where the cochlear nerve enters, and uh, it innervates cochlea. So these are all the anatomical relationships here. And now I would just like to consider one of the most uh, interesting approaches today for treatment of the tumors that are directly in the, in the fourth ventricle. So. Uh, as, what is, as was advised by the professor, by Professor Rotten himself, uh, he was saying that uh, the only case uh, he does splitting of the vermis, the most common procedure to enter the fourth ventricle in the past, today, uh, is when the pathology is in the vermis. Uh, so today uh, are available some much, much less invasive approaches that use the natural borders. Uh, this is one of them. This is the telobular approach, which will I just go through now. So, if you retract the tonsils of the cerebellum, uh, these are the lateral parts in the picture, uh, and the vermis is the median uh, part of the tissue, median uh, in the middle of your skin, right in the middle. So, if you retract these tonsils laterally, you can see uh, the tela and the velum medullary inferior, uh, which uh, covers the posterior, the fourth ventricle from behind. And if you cut through this, it leads you all the way through the uh, fourth ventricle. So this is one of the natural corridors that can be used to enter the fossa that are proven not to cause cerebral transit, cerebral, multi, cerebral mutism in a uh, younger population. Uh, if you need a wider space to to uh, see all of the posterior fossa, you can always do it bilaterally, and in this way uh, free up all this area here. And just uh, last picture of these anatomical slides is the uh, fossa rhom rhomboidea, the most uh, the most anterior part of the posterior uh, cranial fossa uh, on the brainstem. So. Uh, you can see it's standard view, the Calamus scriptorius. Uh, this is uh, the, the stacked up uh, nuclei of the cranial nerves uh, that are going from above to below. And they're giving this, uh, this pen-like view, a pen-like uh, resemblance on the, on the most caudal part of the screen. Uh, so here are just other some important sulcus, the median sulcus and lateral sulcus, uh, which is uh, which is uh, which are the important lam landmarks of this area.
So I am finished with this part now, and I will now go just presentation to finish my presentation as well. Uh, You okay, Slavin? I think he's changing to a new slide. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. A new slide sh sh uh, set. Mm -hmm. uh, nice pictures, huh? Yeah, very nice. Uh, very clear. Uh, uh, yeah, I would look forward to watching this again because well, I need to. What do you use for a neuroanatomy uh, dog? What what does you use? Uh, Grant, Grant's, Grant's anatomy. Well, um, you know, I'm trying to learn the and what's uh, been presented by the Rotong collection as, oh, okay. uh, as the first reference, and up to now I've been, of course, looking at using Netter. Um, and but this is advanced for me. This is advanced in medical school. We don't go into such detail, so uh, it's wonderful to be able to see it like this. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Did you lose me? Uh, can you tell me what was the last part? I will finish. Yeah. Uh, okay. The last part, you were about to change slides. You, you finished the first set completely. Okay, and so I. Yeah, you finished the second set. And. Um, okay, let me just finish it up. Hey, you're seeing now the slides. Approach. Just a second, I don't know what's the okay. problem. Uh, can there you, you go, see my there screen? Televella okay. approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so th this is the last part of my presentation. Okay. So uh, now the, what I showed before you, uh, before in the slides, uh, is the Tilo Wheeler approach. This is the most more precise intraoperative view of this approach. And as I said, the steps are the same: uh, retraction of the tonsil of the cerebellum to the side, cutting of the tilo, tila and villa choroidea of the posterior fossa, and then entering uh, all the way to the uh, to to the uh, post, to the fossa rhomboidea, uh, so you can see you can very very nice here, and uh, these are just indications for using this approach. So uh, this approach this approach can be used in cases of entering for medical biopsy uh, and of course tumors of the rhomboid fossa. This is the most common approach used today in treatment of uh, tumors of the posterior fossa which are not invading uh, the cerebellum or the vertebrae. And uh, of course uh, it allows you all, all uh, to look all the way up to the ceiling duct uh, and uh, also can be used in the treatment of the non-communicating hydrus which is an interesting indication. Uh, this uh, approach is not indicated in the cases of spinal instability. This is very important in pediatric neurosurgery when uh, the young patients have not yet developed the ability to keep their head uh, up. Uh, so uh, this uh, approach should be awarded in, the, in these situations. And of course in diffuse pathology of the board ventricle when nothing can be done in case of metastasis. This area, and uh, this is just uh, uh, this was intended as a short quiz part, but uh, I will just go through it. This is just some of the examples of the tumors that can be found here. So, this is a pro most probably a medulloblastoma, but uh, I also found some indications uh, that this might be in, in the discussions we had in Zark that this may be the main genome of the fourth ventricle. This is a very... So, uh, as I said, uh, the most common site of, of uh, brain tumors in child age is in the posterior fossa. Uh, 